Metro Law nos está visitando de la Universidad de Simon Fraser en Canadá y en realidad es la responsable de esta reunión. Eh, hace mucho tiempo eh, queríamos hacer una reunión sobre trabajo colaborativo en educación secundaria, colaborativo, aprendizaje activo, etc. ¿ya? en educación superior y se nos presentó la oportunidad de hacerla en el contexto de un proyecto de colaboración con la Universidad de Simon Fraser pero Anet no está trabajando en educación superior entonces por ahí aparecieron los contrapuntos Anet es una de nuestras contrapuntos ya ella nos va a hablar de eh, educación primaria. Ahora, ¿por qué no es raro en este contexto hablar de educación primaria? Porque la resolución de problemas, de alguna manera, y aquí me refiero especialmente a la colaboración y resolución de problemas, son habilidades humanas que están presentes desde lo más temprano de la vida hasta lo más... ¿no, ¿Cómo se dice? Los últimos días. ¿ya? Resolver problemas. Entonces, nos pareció interesante además del tema de los recursos. Nos pareció interesante presentar en este contexto algunas experiencias de educación eh, básica y después vamos a tener, para cerrar nuestra presentación, el otro contrapunto. Paula me preguntaba, ¿yo soy el contrapunto? <risa> eh, nos va a conversar Paula, nos va a contar de su experiencia en educación preescolar, donde de nuevo la colaboración y la resolución del problema están presentes naturalmente. ¿Ya? Así que dejo con ustedes a Anet Roló. Muchas gracias por estar acá. Ella no va a hablar en inglés, pero ha preparado su presentación en español por si tenemos algún problema de, 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 de lenguaje. Ya, así que muchas gracias. Hola. Uh, I have no idea what he said, but I'm sure it was wonderful. <laughs> um, I do know he said that I'm going to speak in English and my slides will be in Spanish. And I know I'm going to start talking really, really fast. So tell me to slow down, okay? Remind me. Um, I, part of, um, I, I used Google Translate, so <laughs> some of it's going to not make any sense, but you, you'll do your best. I have a feeling part of what I'm here today is to give you an idea of what we're doing in the elementary levels that maybe will help later on at university as we're trying to change how we teach math and, and help children learn more. Um, about me a little bit, I was an elementary teacher for 10 years. Um, I completed my master's and after I finished my master's, um, Peter Lilladal asked if I would consider studying for my doctorate with him. So I quit teaching and I'm studying in Vancouver and I'm in my fifth year of studies. And I'm supposed to be writing my thesis right now, um, but I'm doing every other project instead. <laughs> I've been here for almost a month with Christian and Natalia, and um, we're working on a project. We were working on ARPA projects, and now we're working on a project with Christian's calculus class, and we have almost five papers. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm here today to talk about my experiences teaching problem solving in mathematics to nine-year-old children. Um, I'm going to talk about the strategies that I used, and I'm going to talk about some of the problems that I've used. And the strategies that I used with the children are the same strategies that I now use when I do workshops for in-service teachers and workshops for pre-service teachers. So these are the same strategies I now use with adults, and they're very similar to ARPA. So we're going to start. Um, I'm going to show you a problem right now. I want you to pretend you are eight years old. Um, do you have a paper and a pencil? Do you have someone that you can talk with? And I'll just show you the problem. So you can use the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine only once. Can you make a sum that is close to one? Just give it a try.
Does anyone have a sum they're brave enough to share? Who thinks they have an, uh, an answer? An answer. Who has an answer? No. No? Not yet. Not yet? Okay. Doesn't have to be the best answer. It has to be an answer. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to make you stop. <laughs> I want one answer. Someone give me one answer. You have an answer? Christian, thank you. Six, five, seven. Like this? Yes. Three, two. Can four. you just give me your final answer? What's your what, what's your what's your like one decimal or zero? What what's your answer? Uh, point nine eight one. Oh. Can anybody beat that one? Okay, at the back. Did anybody get one that started with a one? I have one, but it's far from That's okay, tell it. 1.132. One okay. Um, with, with children in my classroom, we would go over the strategies. We would talk about how, how far is this one from one and how far is this one from one. It's, it's, a, it's a rich problem for children to talk about decimals. That's not awkward at all. <laughs> so these are the kind of problems that I started using in my classroom. But so get back to my talk for a minute. So in preparing this talk about problem solving, um, I was thinking about how much my time in Santiago has been an adventure in problem solving when I'm here, because I do not speak Spanish. Um, so everywhere I go, I'm collaborating with the people that I'm with, all day, all the time, and I have learned so much. Empanada, completo, hola, no mas, queso, nuevo español, claro, chorapan, por favor, bebida, shop, polo, chao, and gracias, no, gracias, gracias. <laughs> and um, obviously, I eat a lot, um, that was most of my words, um, but every word that I learned was learned as a result of collaboration with servers in restaurants, with Christian who left me, with Natalia. It's, I've learned it through collaboration with somebody else. Um, it's the same kind of collaboration that I want in my classroom, where children are learning from each other and with each other. I want them working as a group, not in a group. I want them together. I want them thinking and learning. I don't want to be telling them what it is that I want to know. I want them to know. Because we know from the research that that's not how children learn mathematics. They need to uh, figure it out for themselves. I believe that the person who does the most talking does the most learning. And in my classroom, I was the person doing all of the talking. And my children, we would do some mathematics together, but they would forget it. It, it never stuck. They weren't happy in mathematics. They didn't love math the way that I loved math. So in my fourth year of teaching, I completely changed how I taught. I started with um, ran visibly random groups. Um, non-routine problems, and vertical surfaces. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about each one of those. So uh, visibly random groups. So when I think of all the restaurants I've been in in Santiago, I can't help think of all the random groups I've been in with people who I don't know and they don't know me. Um, 
we still we work to solve the problem of what I was going to eat this time. We, we solve the problem all the time. I learned a lot, and I really hope that they learned a lot as well. These visibly random groups in a classroom are a strategy designed to improve collaboration and engagement in mathematics, and it comes from the work of Peter Lilladal. Through the use of visibly random methods such as numbered cards, all the students within a classroom are randomly assigned to heterogeneous groupings. Um, this is not normal in a classroom. Usually children choose their own partners, and they, they work with their friends, or the teacher selects um, groups based on ability. So this is very different in, in, in our classrooms. And I, it's very different in Canada, and from what I understand, it's very different in Chile as well. Mostly in Canada, children never work in groups. Um, the benefits of visibly random groups are um, increased tolerance. They are, they are kinder and more accepting to each other, which helps with learning mathematics, believe it or not. Um, the elimination of social barriers within the classroom, because you're going to know, you know you're going to work with everybody eventually, it doesn't matter who is more popular and who isn't. Increased knowledge transfer between the students, and we call this mobility of knowledge, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And um, they, they turn to the teacher less, and they start turning to each other for answers as they each become experts. Um, to encourage collaboration, I randomly group my students for almost every activity that we do. And there are many ways, but it must be visible. The students must see that I'm not manipulating the groups, that they can be with their best friend, two of their best friends. They have to know that I'm not um, changing any of the groups up. So I know that Christian uses playing cards. I use technology, and there's just a button down here that says, regroup, and then I just regroup, and then a whole new group of children get grouped. I start with um, groups of two in the beginning of the year, and I work with really engaging problems that make them want to talk to each other, that forces them to work together. And I'm going to show you another one of those right now. So do you have paper, a partner? Just turn and talk to somebody. This is called Which One Doesn't Belong? So which of those doesn't belong? Okay. T it, tell me. Tell me one number that doesn't belong. And if you want to speak in Spanish, Christian will translate. But what number doesn't belong? One, because it doesn't have a four. Did somebody see something different? Which way? And why? It's not a square number. Yes. 144. Why? Because it has three digits. It has three digits. Oh, we had the back there. 64. And why 64? That's the sum of the digits. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's 10. So with, with 
with children, they're not this fast. <laughs> but um, it causes a lot of talk with the students as they think about which one doesn't belong. And they're generally surprised that they all don't belong, if you think hard enough. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch of these. Um, and they, they have ones with graphs and ones with numbers and ones they, it, it's just to get children talking to each other as they look for things in the, in the, it's just a really good one. Um, so let's talk about non-routine non problems for a moment. Um, I'm borrowing this analogy from STEM, but it, it works for me today. When I first arrived in Santiago, um, I never left my apartment without my phone and Google Maps, and I would walk like this. Like, I didn't even look because I needed to know where I was going all the time. I, I didn't trust myself. Um, and I didn't have to think. I, I could just, it would tell me, it would buzz in my hand, turn here, turn here. I didn't have to think. And um, I had no idea where I was going. No idea how to get back home. So after about two days, I put away my phone, and I decided I need to learn where I am in Santiago. And I started looking for landmarks, for buildings, for streets. Um, I explored everywhere, and then I let myself get lost in my environment, and I was able to figure it out. And I can walk quite a long ways. <laughs> I can go really far out by myself. And I found those paths by myself. I forced myself to do it. I think sometimes in teaching mathematics, um, we use the equivalent of Google Maps for our students. Um, we tell them exactly how to do a problem, exactly how to get to the solution, the exact steps to take, and um, they don't have to think. Um, in fact, sometimes I wonder, uh, we prefer if they just um, did what we said and didn't ask any questions at all. Just do what I tell you and you will get the answer. We don't want them to make their own pathway. Maybe not you, but that was me sometimes. Um, <laughs> but are they thinking? Are they learning? I say no. And, and we know this from the research. There's no conceptualization when they're following steps. So non-routine problems are problems for which the solver um, doesn't really know how to begin, necessarily. Um, they're, they're interested in solving, and they're challenged by it, yet they know they're going to be able to do it. So these are non-routine problems, and I use them a lot to, all the time in my classroom. For example, this is a problem from my grade four textbook, and it says recess starts at 10.10, and ends at 10.25 a.m. How long is recess? 15 minutes. Is that a problem? Does this allow them to have many solutions? No. Does it allow them to have extensions? Maybe, depending on the teacher. Does it allow for thinking? I say, oh, allow for thinking? I say no. So instead, I take this problem, I take the same problem, and I change it a bit. Recess is 15 minutes long. When might it start? When might it end? Can you feel the difference in the problem? It changes the thinking. Does this problem allow for many solutions? Yes. Does this problem allow for extensions? So if a child says to me, recess starts at 10, and ends at 10.15, I can say, can you think of a time that doesn't end in a zero and a five? Can you think of a time that starts before 10 and ends after 10? Can you think of a time that might be in the morning? Can you think of a time that might be in the afternoon? Can you think, I can just keep asking questions and changing up the, the problem. Oh, so does it allow for extensions? Yes, does it allow for thinking? Absolutely. But the problem is not inert. 
it requires the presence of a teacher to ask those questions. Um, I call them low floor, high ceiling problems where anyone can get started and it can be pushed and pushed and pushed with questions. One of the ways I get students working on problems, and this, this is different, it's different in Canada and it's different in Chile, is I use something called vertical surfaces. These are my students here. Um, I was in Christian's advanced algebra class last week and his students very naturally just got up and started spreading out their ideas on the board. This is not allowed in elementary classrooms. Students sit in their desks and they do not get out of their desks typically. Is this true in Chile? Usually? Yeah. Um, but if you think of yourselves or in the movies when you see mathematicians and they're up writing on boards, it's, it just seems very natural. When I first came to talk to ARPA, with ARPA and I, I met Patricio, one of the first things he said is, what we do in ARPA is not normal, but it's natural. And that has stuck with me for a long time. That what we, what we want to do is a natural feeling of standing up and working on problems and being in random groups. The benefits of vertical services are that um, mobilization of knowledge. I can, the children can see who's working all around the room and they can share the ideas as the ideas go around the room. Definitely increased engagement. The children really enjoy working on math when they can stand up and work on exciting problems in a group. Um, so there's less behavior problems and they try harder and they keep going for a longer time. One thing that's very important in vertical services is they can only use one pen. So I watched when you were solving the, the decimal problem and you're all writing on your own paper. If I only let that group have one pen, it forces them to work together. It forces them to share their knowledge. As an adult, someone and I had to work with one pen, I hated it because I wanted to have my own pen. But it's a way to make collaboration happen is to force people to talk first before they do any writing. Um, teaches children how to collaborate. So those are the three things I introduced with children in my classroom, and now I use them when I work with adults as well. This is how I teach math to adults. And I just want to end with um, this is my class in my very last year of teaching, and I ask them their thoughts on random groups and vertical surfaces and uh, non-routine problems, and this is what they had to say. If you aren't good at something, then the others can help. You get to learn about other people and see how they work because everybody learns differently. Also, you make new friends. When I choose my partner, I always choose one I already worked with. It's like I already learned with him. I want a different person to learn with. It's more fun. I enjoy random grouping because if I don't know very much about a person, it's a good way to find out more about them. When we work together, they might know more than me, and I might know more than them. I love random grouping because you get to sit with different kids so you get to know them better and know what they are good at. I do not like it when teachers pick where you are because you might be in the same group. We've been doing random grouping for five months and I think it's still awesome and surprising because you get to see who is in your group and get to work with them. Also you get to see how other people work and figure out questions. Building Thinking Classrooms, and I, yeah, I can write Peter's name. Building Thinking Class. Tal vez debería comentar 
que muchas de las cosas que nosotros estamos haciendo en ACPA han sido producto de cuestiones que hemos aprendido de Peter y el equipo de Peter. Uh -huh. yeah. Los grupos aleatorios, por ejemplo, nunca lo habíamos hecho, no se nos había ocurrido. Y cuando nos contaron, nos pareció que tenía sentido, lo empezamos a hacer y eh, nos dimos cuenta que era una cuestión súper simple, pero que producía cambios muy largos. ¿Alguien más tiene alguna pregunta que hacerle a Net? ¿Sí? Eh, mi pregunta es más que en general, y está relacionada también con el, el, el proyecto ARPA. Es que hasta el momento, a través de tres exposiciones que han realizado, la conclusión es que las matemáticas son muy cosas efectivas si se trabaja desde el ámbito social. Porque indudablemente hasta acá. El, los sociales no es el gran, el gran este es un nuevo paradigma dentro de la individualidad de las matemáticas. Oh, Entonces, sí. la pregunta es, dentro del grupo Alfa, ustedes tienen un equipo multidisciplinario, acaban con, pues, han pensado la posibilidad de integrar un sociólogo, una persona que no venga de este mundo de las matemáticas, porque hasta el momento se me ha preguntado a ti que hemos estado frente a matemáticos hablando sobre lo social, pero. Eh, sin tener el punto de vista de una persona que sea experta en el área, como lo puede ser un psicólogo o otra persona. Bueno, esa es mi pregunta. Sí. ¿Es complementaria o otra pregunta? No, es una pregunta. No, no, perdón, pero ahí está. Mi pregunta es muy simple. That's not normal. <laughs> that's not natural either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There isn't that part, yeah. But but once um, the very first time I worked with one pen, I hated it. But I came to love it. Because I was forced I, I couldn't go hide with myself and my paper and write. I had to talk to other people and it was the very first time I actually think I ever collaborated was as an adult when someone took away my pen and I had to talk to the other people, not work with them. I had to collaborate with them. Yeah. Good point. Sí, eh, para responder a tu pregunta, eh, voy, a, voy a decirlo de dos maneras. O sea, voy a contar de dos formas. La primera es que eh, nosotros como matemático, bueno, hay, hay algunos matemáticos en el equipo, pero más son profesores, ¿ya? y profesores de matemática o de educación básica, que tal vez tocan la parte que tú estás pensando. Eh, no tenemos sociólogos, pero nos encantaría. Es un tema de recursos, eh, o, o, o que se haga investigación desde el punto de vista de la sociología o de la psicología, Parece súper interesante y tener eh, sociólogos y psicólogos en el equipo sería fantástico. ¿ya? Eh, pero, que te digo, es más bien un tema de recursos. Por otro lado, también está el hecho de que nosotros hemos tenido experiencia y los profesores que trabajamos son tenido experiencia en ese contexto, en el contexto de social, somos seres sociables y lo que decía Anet eh, de esto de son cosas naturales. Eh, nos han salido un poco por, por la experiencia. Eh, cuando hay un problema que eh, preocupa a dos o tres personas, lo más probable es que se pongan a conversar con nosotros. Y eso es una cosa bastante... Yo imagino que uno lo puede deducir quizás de alguna teoría, o de, pero esto es muy natural. Entonces, como que la, la, el gran desafío para nosotros es poner un problema que sea para todo, para que se pongan a trabajar. Eh, entonces, bueno, eh, eh, muy aceptada tu pregunta y creo que nos gusta incorporar el ejemplo. So, ¿Were you still talking about one pen? Yes. Okay. I, I just want to add, um, I, I don't know if one pen is necessary. It's necessary at the elementary level because they're learning how to work together. It's not always necessary with people who enjoy math and aren't afraid to share. 
I work with teachers who are very afraid of math and don't want to talk to someone about what they know or don't know. So one pen is very important for them because I have to make them work together. Um, like in Christian's class, these students are confident in math. They each had their own pen, yet they're still collaborating. Does that make sense? En la última pregunta, alguien que me levantaba la mano con eh, Jimena. No, pero era, 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 era una pregunta, era como, o sea, era Era un grupo muy competitivo, entonces me sentía muchísimo, no quería tener en el grupo a ella. Y ella decía, ahora yo estoy contenta, y mi compañero también está contenta. Entonces, efectivamente, hay análisis de ese estilo que ha ocurrido dentro del trabajo, y Anet también ha participado. Bien, eh, vamos a agradecerle a Anet, ¿no? ¿Eh? 